This week, the Ontario government announced a major overhaul of policing that's expected to touch virtually every community in the province. John Thompson from our Northwest Ontario hub is just back from touring some of the most remote communities in the north with the Nishnabi Aski Police Service, which patrols those fly-in communities. And John joins us via Skype from Thunder Bay to tell us what he's learned. John, good to see you again. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you? Excellent, thanks. Uh, okay, let's just start with a sort of a general overview, briefly, of what we need to know about this pretty significant overhaul of the Police Services Act that the province announced yesterday. What do we need to know? Well, there's a lot involved in this, but as it relates to First Nations policing services, there's going to be an opportunity to bring them under the Act. Uh, and the reason that's important is because they've been uh, standalone programs rather than services since, uh, since the, their inception in 1992 and haven't been subject uh, to uh, standards when it comes to human resources, when it comes to infrastructure, buildings and detachments, or communications. All right, so in this which is case, going to be a major change. Okay, let's look then more specifically at the service that you hung out with this week, the Nishnabi Aski Police Service, or NAPS as they call it for short. What do we need to know about them? NAPS polices 35 uh, communities in Ontario's far, more, far north. Most of them are remote. And... Um, what and and so the issues of transportation play a major role. Um, the chief of NAPS, Terry Armstrong, tells me that every, uh, at any given time there may be a community without a police officer at all, and most of those officers are working alone. They're working under conditions that are um, in dilapidated buildings. Uh, the cells are antiquated. Uh, there's a very limited number of these communities that have in, that have police services or buildings that come up to what could be described as Ontario code. Hmm. John, I remember years ago we used to call them police forces, and then we started calling them police services. And I gather NAPS yeah. doesn't like either one of those words. What do they go with? Oh, well, it's 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 not about what they like. It's about what how they're defined. Uh, when they when these services were introduced at the federal level in uh, in by an order in ninety one and in ninety two, uh, they came in in Ontario as police programs rather than services. And so when we looked at the Police Services Act, the only part that NAPS and other uh, First Nations police services uh, are prone to in that act is the hiring of officers. So there's no other section of the Police Services Act that actually works uh, to, to govern those organizations. That's why they're known as programs. And why is that a, a, a significant distinction in your opinion? Well, it's a significant distinction in the opinion of juries that have sat through inquests uh, in which people have died due to the, uh, the insufficient infrastructure of those communities. If these things were happening anywhere else, we would be looking at um, we would be looking at immediate responses. Uh, in the case of uh, First Nations, they're just not legislated to have those standards. Hmm. And so, for example, there was a, the case of, uh, of Bruce Munius, um, in which he, uh, in 2006, uh, was in an armed standoff and uh, in Kisheshwan, and... Um, and there was no backup for the single officer who was attending to that scene for 18 hours. So in the, the following year after the inquest uh, uh, resumed, um, another officer had a similar situation with an armed standoff and the tactical response unit took 18 and a half hours. So there's just no accountability in the system if, the, if they don't fall under the legislation. Okay, that kind of gets me to the next question, which is, you know, of course, down here in the capital city, uh, the police budget's over a billion dollars, and, uh, you know, they've got, uh, many would argue they've got adequate resources to the job, given how big the police budget is. Uh, how well or not well resourced are the police services that you hung out with this past week? Well, the, uh, the OPP estimates by 2016 figures that it would cost them between 70 and $80 million dollars to do the job that NAPS does in the north on only 27 million. But even in, in Thunder Bay, uh, we have a, a high homicide rate, you may know, and uh, our police services budget goes over budget every year, and they have the recourse of going to our city council, and then if that if city council turns them down, they can go to civilian oversight bodies above them and appeal to have overtime or extra uh, costs that they've uh, incurred covered. 
And that's not the case either. And so we're looking at, well, according to, again, Chief Terry Armstrong, they're looking at about a $2 million deficit by the end of the year on something that would be a third of the budget it would cost the OPP to police the same area. Hmm. And how about NAPS officers? Do they feel they have adequate resources to do their job in such remote parts of the province? There's a federal report in 2015 that's really interesting that shows that the, uh, the commitment of individual officers to communities outside of First Nations communities is about 58% of them really feel strongly about their community. In, in, uh, in First Nations policing, it's about 85%. And so the officers are going into the schools, they're going in with the uh, community leadership, and that's necessary because in many cases they will depend on volunteers to have to uh, watch detainees if they're out on another call. There are some cases in which uh, the chief and, and council members are actually getting involved in what would otherwise be deemed law enforcement uh, frontline work. Uh, I talked to a, a man in, or a councillor in Bearskin Lake who at one point was hiding in a in a bush behind a house trying to contain a man who had a rifle and was doing a standoff, posting to Facebook that he was threatening his neighbors, and uh, they were he had a radio in his hand and he was waiting for backup to arrive. And uh, if you have elected officials doing that, I think it's safe to say that that's un unreasonable uh, when compared to other uh, police services of Ontario. Hmm. It's hard to imagine that happening in Toronto, for in example. Indeed. Well, let me do another comparison, because I think one of the reasons we love having uh, you uh, in the Northwest, in our new Ontario hub, is that we do want to get some comparisons on how things work in different parts of the province. I know, for example, if you call 911 in the capital city, it doesn't take too long for an officer to show up and and uh, attend to your needs. But what if you're in a remote fly-in community in northwestern Ontario, uh, 400 kilometers north of Thunder Bay? Do you dial 411 or, or excuse me, do you dial 911 to get service or how does it work? Well, uh, the, well the, office, the officer is dispatched. Sometimes there's radios. Uh, the increasing number of communities have cell sub, uh, coverage now. Um, but, um, but it can take, as I say, up to up to 18 hours for that to happen, uh, for there to be any any backup arriving of any kind. And so, a lot of what those officers have to do is just try to contain people, especially in violent incidents or gun crime. There was a a case in which an officer, uh, there was a murder, and uh, the victim was taken to the nursing station, and the suspect fled the scene. So in that case, there are three crime scenes, at least three crime scenes that officer is going to be containing. And at that point, he received a gun call. And so uh, there's just the concern uh, on top of the human resources and the safety factor is simply the investigation factor, the ability for those officers to, to perform proper investigations and ensure that people who are offending their, their, uh, their fellow citizens um, are, are, are brought to justice. Because these communities, in some cases, are 350, 500 people. And if you know that the police were unable to hold together a case against somebody who murdered your family member, you're going to see that person all the time. And so there's a piece, a, a piece and, and element to all of this as well. Have there been steps taken to try to ameliorate this situation? I'm not sure what could be done about it, given, you know, given the numbers involved. But uh, have there been efforts undertaken? The efforts, uh, this, is, this is really a spectacular case. The story that we cover on, uh, on TVO.org today is a spectacular case of First Nations leadership uh, building mountains of evidence about the inequity that exists in the system uh, over a course of the last 10 years or so. So, for example, there, um, there was a fire in the Kesheshawan building in 2006 uh, that tore through the building and killed 22-year-old Ricardo Wesley and 20-year-old James Goodwin. Um, and in the inquest to that, uh, the, the jury noted that there were 19 stations that required replacement. In uh, 2013, uh, Lena Anderson was arrested. Uh, again, all these cases uh, that I'm referring to now are public intoxication essentially, um, after an altercation in her home. And she uh, took her own life in the back of a cruiser. She was un the, the police were unable to put her in a cell because there was no heat in the detachment. So they were actually rolling around the community with a, with a prisoner in the back of the vehicle as, their, as plan A. 
And so over the course of the last decade, these inquests and legal proof that there is inequity in the system is what has pressured the Ontario government to respond with legislation. John, it is always illuminating talking to you. And uh, as always, we're grateful that you're up there staffing our Northwest Ontario hub for us. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening, Steve. We'll talk to you again soon. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.